share all the fun stuff um, that they went through. Alex. Uh, so my name is Alex Welch. Um, I'm the co-founder of a company called Photobucket. Photobucket allows you to upload your photos and videos, edit those, and share them with the rest of the world digitally. Um, how many of you guys have heard of Photobucket? Oh, good. How many, how many use Photobucket? All right, good. And I'm guessing you probably all use it for slightly different things. Um, so I really wanted to spend some time talking about um, the company, how we started the company, uh, some of the pitfalls, some of the challenges, some of the success, some of the metrics, um, and, and it's, really, it's really meant to give you guys an idea of, of what we've been through over the last, actually five years this month is when, when we launched the site. So um, back in late, late 90s, I was graduating uh, from Colorado State University. If there's any buffs here, I'm, I'm sorry, but um, we, Really, really, I was, I was you know, getting out of school and trying to find the next hot, hot startup. There was money being thrown around. Pretty much every, every dot-com idea you could think of, people were raising huge amounts of money. And um, for the good or for the bad, I was thinking to myself, wow, I wish I was in the position where I could go out and raise a bunch of money with some idea that maybe is valid, maybe isn't, and try to do something with it. At least I can say I raised a bunch of money and you know maybe make a little bit on the way and 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 that's your you know that that's your first startup. Um, I got out of school. I went to uh, Level Three Communications in Brimfield, and the markets crashed. And uh, I was I was feeling very good that I was at a bigger company and I was in a stable environment. And um, I was I was laughing at the people that were trying to start sites that I, I didn't feel had a business model. They were starting sites because the money was coming in so fast. Everybody with the idea was getting funded. Um, so I really spent my first couple years out of college uh, just learning to, to write code. Um, I was not writing web code. I was writing uh, C and Perl and really fun stuff like that. Um, the markets continue to, to decline. I think my first stock options were at $130, and I left the company when the stock was at $4, and so I never, never realized any of that. But um, I really wanted to figure out how to program for the web. That was where I started Photobucket. It was, how do I learn to do this stuff that everybody's doing on the web? Um, so went out and bought some books, went to Google, searched a lot of things, and started writing web code. Um, that was PHP, uh, Cold Fusion, kind of anything I could learn to, learn to write code in. Um, for me, just to write code wasn't enough. So I thought, what can I do with this? I clearly am not needing these skills at my current position so much, but could I take this and, and actually do something interesting with it? Uh, so I literally was out using a website one day, and I was trying to find somewhere to upload photos. There's 100 photo sites at the time. There's probably 10,000 now. But for me to find somewhere that I could simply just go upload, give me my link, let me share this, let me put it in a message board, I couldn't find anywhere that would let me do that really easy. Um, there was a bunch of the traditional photo print companies out there like uh, Shutterfly and Snapfish, um, Ophoto. There's a whole host of them out there. And um, the annoying thing for me was that in order for me to view somebody else's picture, I had to register for the site. And I thought, what, why is this walled garden exist? And why are they making it so difficult to do something that I want to do? Um, so I started looking around and asking people on the message boards, where do you host your photos? What, what do you, how do you share photos online? And there was just a hodgepodge of answers. It was all across the board from, oh, I run my own web server, or I'm running a web server somewhere. Um, I'm using this site, but they keep disabling my, my photo links, and so I changed to another site. And so really, at that point, I realized there was this interesting time where the demand was there for people to share photos digitally and link those photos. And what I mean by link those photos is upload the photo, and we give you a HTML code, and then you can take that code and embed it anywhere on the internet. Um, and a lot of the companies were looking at this behavior and saying, this. This isn't a model. Um, for example, Sony had a, a site called Image Station, which I believe they finally shut down. 
But uh, you would go upload a photo after you went through this hideous registration process, get the link, go link the photo, and the next day, they wouldn't just remove your link, they would actually change the photo, they would change all the links around, so if you have an eBay auction with your car, and the next day it might be a picture of somebody's, you know, somebody's dog, and so I thought, wow, this is, this is more than annoying, um, and, and there's still nowhere to do this, so I took um, the web skills I had, and the market demand I saw, and I literally put Photobucket up, um, I think the first rev took me eight hours to write, and that was probably over a couple nights. Um, the great thing about internet startup is there's no real investment needed to launch a website. I think I registered my, my domain, and you know I, I rented one of these servers for, I don't know, I think $49 a month, and that was my startup cost. You don't have to go build buildings, and you don't have to invest in a, a bunch of things that traditionally uh, people had to invest in, which is a great, great advantage that I saw um, with the internet. Um, so. Just put Photobucket out there as a place to go and upload and, and share. Um, one of the things early that, that I realized was when you're building something, you really have to believe in, in what you're using and you've gotta just spend as much time talking to the, really the customers and the end users as you can. So I would sit there at night, and I would write code for a couple hours, then I would go browse all the message boards then I would go answer all the customer support questions. And kind of between those three things, I really felt like I knew what people wanted, what was missing, what they liked. Um, and at the end of the day, it came down to a really, really simple concept. It was make it simple and make it reliable. I think a lot of people don't realize that reliability is, is a real strategic advantage. Um, there's been a lot of websites that started to hit that ramp and failed somewhere along the way and somebody passed them, or they never quite got back to the, the traffic they were at. So I, I talk about simplicity and reliability, and people say, oh, that's just a given. You know, it's not a given. Sites like Photobucket and YouTube and MySpace and Facebook have spent extraordinary amounts of money scaling these services to handle literally millions of transactions a second, and it's not one or two servers that does this. Um, it's not a few lines of code that does this. So reliability was really key in making, making a simple service. Uh, so as a, as the service started to grow, um, I was now at two servers instead of one, so I was probably spending $100 out of, out of my own pocket every month. Um, I was still on my own. Um, I went and told my parents about this idea, and they said, that's great, there's 100 other photo sites out there. And I said, I know, but there's no one that's doing it this easy. Um, so really from there, let the thing grow very, very organically. Never spent, still haven't spent a dollar on marketing. Um, we don't. We don't buy advertising, it's really word of mouth. Um, so about six months in, I was probably at that point at about 15 or 20 servers being managed remotely, uh, starting to stress, definitely starting to stress. Um, I had little money at the time, I had no extra hours in the day, I needed some sleep, and that was really the point when I stepped back and I said, is this something that I can run with? Is there a real opportunity here? You know, how do I take this to the next, the next step? Um, so I naively, I, I started looking through um, business blogs, business journals, and I just randomly started calling VCs in California. I called Bob Kegel out of Benchmark. I called a number of different people and I told them this idea and I, I, I think I got laughed at. I'm pretty sure I got hung up on once or twice um, and I never really got a chance to pitch the idea. Uh, I knew that it was working, but everybody saw. One, I was in Colorado, which I can talk about later as being good and bad. Um, two, it was, it was an idea that was very capital intensive, it was very expensive to, to scale, and the, the monetization components weren't there yet. Um, so what I did is I stepped back and I looked at the huge market demand that was happening, um, and I looked at what is the cost to build this business. And one of the things that, that really sticks in my head, um, Jim Crow at level three always talked about silicon economics, and that price compression on bandwidth and hardware specifically was gonna continue to drive downward. Uh, we started hearing about internet advertising, which was in its infancy, but it was gonna grow upward. And I looked and I said, somewhere these lines cross. I don't know where it is, it could be next year, it could be in 10 years, but somewhere I think that there's gonna be more money to make than it's gonna cost to run this service. And that's when I said, you know what, I'm gonna go for this. Um, and I said, I can't do this by myself, so 
I had a, a good friend of mine that actually hired me out of college, um, Darren Crystal, which is uh, my, my fictitious partner here. Um, he he's, couldn't make it tonight, but uh, he, he sends his, his apologies. Um, and, I, and I ran this idea by him, and he said the same thing my parents did. Well, there's 100 photo sites out there. And I said, but that's OK. It, it's not, you know, some of the most successful people in the world, um, Sam Walton, for example, they took an idea and they did something different with it and did it better. And I was really a believer that you don't have to have a super unique idea to build something. Um, to this day, PhotoBucket has no patents. I actually don't believe a whole lot in patents. I, I think the internet is going to change the way that patents were going forward. When I say I don't believe in patents, I, I mean I don't believe in patents on internet technologies. Uh, patents for physical goods, I, I definitely am a big believer in uh, because there is protected IP there. But a, a web service or a widget that I create online in a couple hours, how can I really own and, and file, file you know, IP on that? So for PhotoBucket, it was, it was really about finding the opportunity and at that point in time was finding the right partner. So Darren and I um, spent many nights talking about this business. Uh, he, he wasn't quite as tapped out as I was on credit cards at the time, so he brought a little bit of credit card money to the table, um, and we continued to build the service. Uh, I got him doing the same exact things I did. It was write code, read the blogs, answer customer support, and that was what we did night after night uh, into the wee hours of the morning. And I, I really credit a lot of their, a lot of the success overall with just being that close to the customer. Um, kind of moving, move fast forwarding a little ways, uh, we, we both were fully, fully invested, fully going to go for this now. Um, we knew VCs didn't want to talk to us. So we decided we were going to go raise money a more traditional route. We were going to go to a bank. Um, I never knew it was so hard to borrow $100,000 from a bank, but it was very, very difficult. Uh, we pitched all kinds of bankers here locally and uh, finally got a guy out of Guarantee Bank in Longmont named, named Ed Lister to loan us $100,000. And he actually funded a Exabyte's first servers. Um, this is not a VC type funding. I'm no dilution, no equity changing hands. It was, here's the titles, to, here's a third mortgage on our house. If this thing goes belly up, Darren and I are both gonna go for the, the bankruptcy doors and start over. We're, we're young, we, we can, worst case, we start over. So we literally gave them the third right to the house. Um, and that was how we got our first $100,000. What did we spend that money on? We spent that money on servers. It was really just servers and getting some space to put more servers. Uh, we were leasing everything out of a co-location space in, in Texas, and Darren and I, both being technical, said we want to manage this ourselves. It's really, really important for us to build things. We're engineers and we like to build. We don't want to just run this business and have somebody else managing it. We actually want to build this ourselves so we know it can scale. Uh, so we turned Darren's basement into a makeshift uh, data center. We had more power brought into his basement. We opened every window we could. Um, and we literally took, put a rack in there, and we started building servers. Uh, we probably had, I don't know, probably 10 servers in there. And you know, the, you could, we'd go out and <laughs> we'd watch the power meter spin. And it would, it, it, we knew we were starting to draw real power. And so what we did at, at that point is we moved the, moved the servers down to um, South Denver did a big migration, got all the data over from the lease colos to, to um, the, the, uh, the owned infrastructure and went along managing it going forward. Um, the biggest challenge there was Darren and I both lived North Denver. The data centers were off Arapaho and South Denver. For the first probably three months that we were managing themselves, no less than one time a day, each of us were driving down there answering pages. We had no remote reboots, we didn't have any hands on. This data center at the time didn't even have somebody staffing it 24 seven, so there was nobody to call. Uh, so we uh, racked up lots of miles on the cars. Thank God gas was cheaper then because I, I'm not sure if we would have been able to do it now. Um, but we, we really spent, spent the next, probably the next six to 12 months building. Um, sometime I would say probably in 2000, so started the company in 2003. Um, 2005, we actually started getting some inbound calls from VCs. And this was, this was gratifying for me because I knew they didn't want to listen to me before, but all of a sudden they wanted to know 
what are we doing? I saw your Alexa ranking, which is the Bible for a lot of VCs. I'm not quite sure why, but it's a, it's a broad overview of how a company is doing. Um, so we got some calls, and I pretty much said no. So my, one of my first lessons to everybody is learn how to say no. Um, I can probably name 10 times that I've said no, and I can name a huge advantage out of every one of those. Uh, so we got uh, enough calls that we decided we should actually maybe entertain this. We were break even. Um, believe it or not, in the early days, we didn't even charge for the service. We had a little PayPal donate button on the site. Uh, that donate button brought in like ten, fifteen thousand dollars a month in three to ten dollar donations, and that's before PayPal fees, which were ridiculous. So we were we were essentially the donations were keeping the site going. I knew long term we couldn't be a, a, a not for profit donation site that could grow this way, but it was helping really sustain the business. Um, met with VCs on the East Coast, met with VCs on the West Coast. Tried to get in and meet with some of the VCs in um, Colorado. Didn't have a lot of luck just because the internet was something a lot of people were just staying away from. There was a few firms that east and west coast that were ready to dive back in. Uh, so we, we actually uh, got to know some guys, the, co the uh, I guess their code name is the Hen Packers out of, out of Boulder. Is anyone familiar with the Hen Packers? Anybody heard of them? Maybe it's a name they don't even use anymore. <laughs> but. Uh, there, there were some, some guys that, it was just you know, a bunch of guys that invested in startups and we talked to them and they loved the idea and they threw out a term sheet because they knew we were, start, we were starting to talk to people and this term sheet was very, very low. I think it was low single million um, pre-money, it was a couple hundred thousand dollars in and uh, we didn't know what to think. We thought, geez, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars looks really good. We've got our houses on the line here for a measly hundred thousand. Let's, let's, let's think about this. Um, so spend a lot of time educating ourselves. And engineers, VC, we don't know anything about it. We don't know what terms mean. We don't know what liquidation rights are. We don't know what participation means and preferences. None of this stuff, we, we didn't know it. So we, we learned. We, we figured it all out. Um, started negotiating our own term sheets and uh, essentially got, got a term sheet from somebody, this, this company locally, um, and then had a New York firm uh, give us a term sheet. I wanna say that that term sheet was a $600,000 investment on about a two million um, pre-money. Uh, again, sounded good. Uh, got some interest out of the West Coast and in came a ter term sheet for $10 million. And I thought, wait a minute, we haven't done anything different in the business are these term sheets not based on things like revenue? No, they're not. They're based on how bad they want the business. So, so once we figured that out, we, we now had to balance, do you take the most money you can get? Do you partner with the people you like the most and trust the most, or is there some middle ground there? Uh, we actually ended up partnering up with uh, Inside Venture Partners out of New York, and they did not have the best term sheet. Um, they were the nicest guys, they believed in the business, and they were the first ones to call me um, once, we, once we started getting the inbounds. And for us, it was really about teaming up with somebody that had seen a company scale. Uh, when I was doing a lot of research on the VCs we were talking to, the West Coast VCs tend to put huge amounts of pressure. If anyone's raised money from a West Coast VC, um, you will notice there is insane pressure to scale businesses very quickly. Whether that's spend all their money, go raise more, they don't care. They want to get this thing from point A to Z as quickly as they can. Now, the guys out of New York really, if, when we looked at their portfolio, were about building, building solid businesses long term that go public and, and are still standalone and, and sustainable businesses. For us, that was what was important. We never thought about what is our exit strategy early on. We didn't sit down and write a business plan. I still have our first executive summary that I tried to pitch early on and it was, I think four paragraphs long. Um, to this date, still don't have a, a formal business plan. We do have we do have you know our business initiatives and strategic opportunities that we're we're, we're going after, um, but didn't sit down and do a formal formal business plan. Um, so took our first first round of money. It was uh, I want to say it was about two and a half million dollars on eleven. I talk about the numbers a lot. It's not because they're things that 
I'm bragging about, it's because I think a lot of people are curious. What do these numbers look like? What do you do with the money? What do the terms look like? And so one of the things that you'll get to know is I'll talk about it all. I'll talk about what the preferences were. I'll talk about how we structured the, the, the investment. And I think those are, those are things that we learned and I think are really important to understand. So we, have, we raised a couple million dollars. Um, at that time, we, we actually demanded that the VCs pay off the $100,000 loan that we had so we could get third title on our house back, um, which was important to both, both of us. Uh, we were both on our wife's insurance policies and had no paychecks, so we demanded that we get a nominal paycheck. Um, so there, there was typical no negotiations. Uh, that money, uh, we raised it and hired our first employee. Uh, the first employee we hired was our, our customer support rep that is still with us today, and she was really there to take a few of the long, long nights that we spent um, doing email and, and and do that herself as well as feedback to us kind of what's going on with the customers because again that's very important. Um, so scale the business going forward I think we by the end of 2005 uh, we were at oh gosh we were probably at yeah six people uh, we have one of our early early our, our VP of technology is here Mike Clark and he was um, actually one of the one of the first execs we hired at the company and um, for us, it was about building. We, we, didn't, we didn't have any business people. We had myself, Darren, customer support, technology, engineering. We had no sales, no biz dev, no accounting, no marketing. Um, it was about building the product. So a lot of people say, okay, well, did you come up with a plan? Did you go hire the people to execute on the business? And then how did you surround the business with the, the people to go do the, you know, do the work and, and build the things? And we went exact opposite. We just built. We built and built and built, and as we needed to, we surrounded um, the company with the right people at the right time. Fast forward another year, um, the company's pretty much break even, spending a little bit here and there, reinvesting everything we had, mostly in people and servers. Um, I was starting to realize we needed to hire some business folks. Uh, I tried to recruit here in Denver, and I was just not having the luck that, that I was hoping. Um, so literally one, f I, I believe it was a Thursday night, we had a board meeting here in Denver, and uh, we talked about how are we gonna hire in somewhere that's more internet savvy from the business side, meaning sales, business development, somebody that's really in the heart of things. Um, and so that night we, were, um, we decided that we needed California presence. That next weekend, my wife, my dog, and our forerunner were full of our stuff and we went to California. We literally um, didn't, we just, we just went. We said, we need to go out there and we don't know how long we're gonna be there. We don't know what we're gonna do. We're just gonna go out and, and figure it out. So went out and hired our, our first couple um, execs on the business side out there. Uh, continued to scale the business out there. And we, right after we started getting some, at least some, some people in the local California area, um, we started getting some inbound interest from California VCs. So if you're familiar with Sand Hill Road, it's, a, it's, it's literally one road that, that I would say 70% of the big deals come out of in, in the valley. And um, it was interesting. I saw the same thing happen all over again. We got a term sheet for, um, interesting, we actually got a term sheet from Bob Kegel, which was uh, the benchmark guy that wouldn't, wouldn't talk to me in the early days. Uh, he funded eBay early on. Um, we got a term sheet from him. and. Uh, I said no. I just cold said no. I said we can do better, and uh, here's the terms I want. And if you can't get there, then you know I'm, I'm confident we can keep running the business without more money, or we'll find money somewhere else. And um, we talked and talked and talked. I loved Benchmark. I loved Bob. I loved how they approach things. What I didn't love was they couldn't get over a couple million dollars in post money valuation, which again we're, we're talking at this time we're talking the difference between a thirty. Two, and I think we were asking for a $35 million post, valuation, post money valuation. And for a VC to not do that deal was, is really odd. Usually a few million dollars, a deal that size, is, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna make or break a deal. But the, ter the terms weren't there, so we didn't get it done. Um, a week later, we got a term sheet for $40 million. I thought, wow, we're seeing the same story again. Revenues are the same as they were last week. Um, about a week later, got introduced to uh, Gus Ty over at Trinity Ventures, uh, had a dinner. The next day, he said, I wanna see if we can make this deal happen. And he said, can I come in and talk to you? 
I said, sure, come on in. I'm sitting in, my, sitting in our office downtown Palo Alto. And he said, what is it going to take to get this deal done? I want to know, and I want to figure this out right now. And I'm like, well, I'm not really ready to talk about it, but OK. I, I literally started drawing numbers on the board. And that night, we handshook on the terms that I wrote on the board. And it, it was interesting, because a number of times throughout the conversation, it was, oh, we can't do that. And I said, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'm not, I'm, it's OK. I'm fine with it. We'll, talk hopefully down the road. And uh, we, we raised money. Um, that, that round, I believe, was a, 70, a $72 million pre, and we raised about $10.5 million. And that money was really to scale the business. We, we decided we weren't going to try to run this thing break even anymore. We were actually going to go out and build out a sales team, really build out the business side, and, and make a, a real run for it on the, on the revenue side. Um, by this point, we had obviously gotten rid of donations and had paid services. We had had um, advertising. We're primarily advertising driven. Uh, so that was, well, actually, I'll back up a little bit because one of the other important uh, things that happened, I, I talk about these forks in the road. And one of the things that happened early on was we, we had donations. And I knew advertising was a viable business long term, but I knew it was going to piss off customers, really. and so. We, we refrained from advertising on the site at all in the early days. And I actually had a guy um, out of New York from Google come to me early, early on and say, look, I'll write you a check for as much money as you plan on making for a week if you just run these things for a couple days. And I was like, well, no brainer. OK, I'll, I'll do it. It's, uh, you know, we'll put a few thousand dollars extra in our pockets and you know, fund the business for another couple months or whatever it was. So, so we, we did that, and advertising actually worked on the site. And so that was the point when donations kind of went off. We did have a premium service that we were planning on launching. And we essentially, from there, um, advertising became the primary revenue stream. Um, one of the other important forks in the road at that time was, do we advertise or do we just make everything paid? We were at that time up to, gosh, we were probably at 5 million registered users. And we thought, gosh, if we can get 2 3% of these people to pay a couple bucks a month, we can really run the business off of that versus keep it free. Uh, we decided against that because really to scale a business, we were all about masses. We were about the audience. So, for us, it was about getting as many eyeballs as we could, as fast as we could. So that was, that was one of the other big decision points is do you go free or do you, do you uh, go for a paid model? Um, the internet lends itself much better than, a, than a, you know, an offline model for, for free and paid. But uh, we, we raised money from Trinity. Um, and at this point, the internet was hot again. It was in, we raised money in 2006. It was about one year after our first round. Um, things were going really well on the internet. There was ad dollars coming in. There was a lot of talent out there. Um, there was some big acquisitions starting to happen. And for the first time, Darren and I actually started having the conversation of, what do we do long term with this business? I remember, um, I remember sitting down with one of our VCs, and he said, Alex and Darren, you guys are not going to give this business to your kids. They're not going to give it to their grandkids. I hate to spoil your, you know, your expectations, but the legacy can live, but chances are this business isn't going to go through the families like a traditional, maybe a brick and mortar business might might do. So we we realized at that time in, in 2006 that we need to at least start thinking about an exit strategy. And all throughout the throughout the investments, Darren and I really really kept everything under our belts. We continue to run the company. A lot of the a lot of the um, investment rounds will be very onerous. They'll have all kinds of clauses in them that they can kick you out as the CEO or the CTO. They'll have things like, you know, big decisions. They can override you. Um, you you want to make sure that that you can still control the business. So Darren and I, it was it was always important for us to hold more than half the company, and it was always important for us to have the decision-making power that we needed. And we had VCs that said, look, we're always going to let you make the decisions. You know, I, even our VCs, we loved them, but there was there were some heated board meetings because they like something, sometimes things to go a little differently. So uh, for us, it was um, building. I think end of 2006, gosh, we probably ended. We had the company up to, do you remember, Mike? It was probably 60, 50, 60 employees, about that size. Um, we were at, I would say at that time, we were probably at about the 40 million registered user range, continuing to grow. Um, got into 2007, 
and we actually got our first inbound interest uh, call about an acquisition. And Darren and I, again, didn't think, we're gonna build this thing and sell it for a lot of money. That's not, that's not how you, you think when you're passionate about something, you, you're building it because you've, you love the product and you love the service. Um, and so we didn't know what to do. We took it to our investors and you know, they pretty much said, look, let's, let's just keep building. Um, it's interesting, but things are going really well. Um, so we, we said, okay, well, that's fine. We just wanna make sure that we're gonna pass up on this and, and keep going. Because sometimes when you say no, that means no, and you're not gonna have the chance again. And so we, we uh, continued to build. We, we said, you know what, it's interesting, but it's, it's not that interesting. Value, valuing a company that's growing very fast, as you've probably seen with YouTube type and Skype acquisitions, they're, they're based on some future cash flow or future discounted cash flow model that is really just that. It's a model that is at best case, this thing's gonna do X, Y, and Z. And so it, it's hard for these media, big media companies or big potential buyers to look at a photo bucket or any of these websites and say, what is this thing really worth to us? Um, so we, we felt that Photo Bucket was valuable to certain media companies, and uh, media companies for us because it was the it was the Viacoms, it was the I'll, I'll put Google and Yahoo and Microsoft and News Corp. It was those companies, um, IAC. Th those companies were really the ones that we felt long term we could live inside and and be successful. And so we, Darren and I, we decided to sit down and talk about what was really important to us at that time. Is, it a, is the money important? Is running the business important? Is the people we're gonna work with important? Is the company we're gonna be part of, you know, especially if it's a public company, how important is that to us? What is that gonna mean to our lives? And so we, um, we talked about a lot of these things and uh, this, took, this took literally months we talked about this. And I remember I woke up one morning and it was the first time I had ever really had the thought of what do I have to lose and what can I still gain? Um, we were at a point where we had burned through probably about five million of the 10 million newest round we had raised. Um, profitability was looking like it was possible in the next few months and maybe the next year, depending on how fast you spend. But we didn't know, do we raise more money or do we look at other options or do we just continue to build the company? Um, so we, we went out and started talking to private equity firms. Uh, we had a, a soft term sheet come in at about a $200 million valuation, which was really uh, putting about, it was probably about $25 million into the company and taking, the, the whole thought was take the company from where it was to the public markets. Um, after your Series C, you've got your Series A, your Series B, now your Series C. The pressure is building. Everybody needs the big exit for this thing to be successful for all of them. So we looked at the numbers and said, wow, the average VC wants at least a five. Chances of a seven to 10 X is, that, that's really what they're looking for. And so we said, what is the real chance that we can take this company public at a billion dollars in the next couple years? Um, we looked at the numbers and we said, we think we can get there. It's gonna take a lot of work. It's gonna take the markets continuing to climb, um, but we think it's possible. So let's, let's consider going that route. Um, we had gotten, we had never signed anything, but we had gotten close enough in the terms that we felt like that deal, that venture deal could happen. Um, that deal was structured essentially, they were going to do a partial buyout of the company, put a bunch of money into the company, the share, all the existing shareholders were gonna get some money in their pockets so we could relieve the pressure from some of the early stage uh, or the early VC money we had because those guys at this time are looking, saying, gosh, we can, if we can get a couple, couple extra money now, great, stick it, stick it in the bank and go for the home run, we can get the best of both worlds. Um, so we, we really were set on, on going for it. Um, we were already talking to investment banks about what does it mean to go public and what is the public IPO roadshow like. Uh, I continue to get more and more scared. I, I thought, gosh, do I really want to be presenting this business to Wall Street? Um, I'm an engineer, public speaking is, is not my thing, although I love doing it with smaller groups, I'm not gonna go present it to, to a much bigger organization, much bigger, um, really, you know, a, a bunch of people on Wall Street. So the discussions kind of went as, 
okay, you're going to go public. Do you think you want to hire a CEO to do this? I'm like, gosh, for the first time, I'm thinking I could lose control of something I just built from a decision-making standpoint. Do I really want to do that? Um, or do I want to step into bigger shoes and, and wear suits and go be on, be on Wall Street and present this thing to, to, to take it public? Um, so the timing worked out for us. The acquisition markets on the tails of the YouTube acquisition were, were good for us. Uh, we had a number of people throw in, or a number of companies throw in offers. And uh, Darren and I sat down and really said, this is the term we want. This is between the two of us um, at Village Inn on 120th. That's our, that's our hangout spot. Uh, but we, we said, these are the terms we want, and uh, we're going to say no if it's not this term. And so we got, uh, we got some term sheets from some potential acquirers. I'm not going to name the names of those, those folks, but it was in the, in the list I gave you earlier of the large media companies. And um, we looked at the terms, and we said, no. <laughs> we said, this doesn't make sense. We're not going to do this. We went home that night and said, gosh, should we have said yes? Maybe we should have. Uh, but we said no. So what ended up happening, I was I actually had a, uh, I had a speaking event with a red herring down in Monterey. Um, in California, I was still out there at this time. And I got a call from somebody over at Fox, and we had talked to Fox some in the past, but Fox was always busy, and they had talked to us, but they hadn't talked serious. And I had always heard about these big deals happening somewhere really quickly, somewhere back in the corner, somewhere you know, remote. And I thought, gosh, is that really how deals happen? It is, it did happen that way. Um, I went down that morning, I did my red herring speech. Uh, Peter Levinson, which is the president of Fox, met with me that afternoon for about four hours, and that night uh, Rupert Murdoch and I met and essentially closed the deal. We literally sat in a room, they, they actually wouldn't let me go, they said, we're, we're gonna keep you here and we're gonna figure this deal out. And I knew at that time, Negotiating with them was, was going to be difficult because really what they do is they just wear you down, wear you down, and so every 10 minutes I'd step out, I'd call Darren, I'd call my VCs on the East Coast, which it was getting late, so they're, they're like, look, let's worry about this tomorrow, let's sleep on it. I'm like, no, Rupert is coming in tonight and he wants an answer. <laughs> so so we, uh, we continue to hash it out and with it, it, the first five minutes of the meeting, I, I told them what the deal needed to be. Um, that was the deal that happened. I didn't move. I said, look, this is the deal it needs to be. We have another deal, and we did, but it was, you know, it was, it was a deal that had different types of terms. It was a partial versus a full buyout. And we said, um, we said this, I, I just sat there and said this is a deal that we need. Um, another note is we had hired through this process of raising money, looking at our options, we had hired a Lehman Brothers to advise us on these big decisions. Um, I like Lehman Brothers. I wouldn't hire them again for what we needed, um, just because it, it didn't didn't go really well from a, from our standpoint. It was all about putting together big decks and selling Photo Bucket on on models. And I was a big believer that companies are bought, not sold. If somebody wants this business, they see the growth in it, they're going to pay for it. Um, so. I, Literally, I, I sat with Peter Levinson and Krista Wolf, which was the CEO of MySpace, for hours and hours, and it was the three of us that negotiated the deal. Um, and we would you know, go back and forth, back and forth, and I said, no, I told you I wanted this four hours ago now, and that's, that's where I'm at. So I made my investors the bad guys and said, look, they have to have at least 5x their return, and they raised money, you know, or they invested at this amount of money, and I don't, I don't have any control over it. So I, I knew things were getting tense because I, I kept seeing them walk out and talk on the phone. And what it, what, what it was is Rupert was flying in, and the Fox guys wanted to tell Rupert the deal was done. And so there was a point where they actually broke a little bit and said, OK, I think we're there. And I, I then later learned that you know Rupert was coming up. So I was actually sitting out in the hallway, because they asked me to leave and said Rupert could be coming. So I'm sitting in the hallway. and. He literally walks right by me, and I'm like, "Okay, well, there's him and the security guys." And you know, he didn't even didn't even look at me. And I walked in, shook his hand, and he said, "Congrats! I hear the deal's done." And I said, "Well, we've agreed to terms, but you know, we're far from closing the deal." Um, so the next 24 hours, I uh, stayed at the hotel and went through the fine, really just all the fine details of the entire deal. Um, there was a number of things really important to Darren and I. It was first off maintaining the control of the company. Uh, my biggest concern was our people, and I had seen that 
a lot of companies get acquired and they essentially get blown apart inside a larger organization. And I really wanted to keep our team together. Uh, that, was, that was my number one goal. Uh, my number two goal was that I wasn't tied to something for longer than I was comfortable. I didn't know what it was going to be like working in a big public company. I didn't know if I wanted to stay there. I didn't know if I wanted to you know, take off. I wasn't sure what it was like, so I wanted to have the option to, to or, or at least the flexibility to do what I want after a couple of years. And so really at the end of the day, the, you know, the, the terms for Darren and I that were important, we, we, got, we got to them. Um, I still run the company. Darren's still the CTO. We still make all the primary decisions. Uh, Fox, honestly, they leave us alone. They're, they give us advice, give us money when we need servers, give us you know ideas on how to build revenue. But we're very, very standalone inside of inside of Fox. Um, one note: uh, back about the time of the acquisition, I chose to move back to Colorado. Um, I was very worried that I was going to be hauled down to Beverly Hills, which is where Fox is. And I love Beverly Hills, but I am not a LA guy, and I just didn't want to live in Beverly Hills. So, so I, I moved back to Colorado and worked into my employment contract that I get to spend so many days a year here, so they couldn't, again, force me to do something that, that I wasn't really comfortable doing. Um, so we, we were uh, acquired by Fox, and that was really the, you know, for us and the team, I mean, to have your, your first engineers that, you know, are in their early, mid-20s come out of college and jump into a startup and, and have a success was really the most gratifying thing for us. Um, seeing them be able to go out and do things that maybe they wouldn't have been able to otherwise do. See, see them get to experience that. Um, they're all still with us. They, none of them bail, none of us, none of really the, what I call, I have a kind of regrettable and unregrettable turnover. And um, none, of our, none of our unregrettable turnover is, has left. And that's, you know, that means that some people have left and it was okay with us. Um, but the people that we care about have not left us. So uh, we've, we've continued to build the company. Um, we're, some stats were at about, gosh, well, we did uh, 42 million global uniques um, this month, which is unique visitors to the site. Uh, we serve out in any given day probably about four billion uh, objects to the internet every day. Um, we, gosh, we're probably at about 125 employees. Uh, I would say 75% of them are here in Denver. Um, Denver is engineering. We love the engineering talent here. They're heavily motivated. They're not just doing this because it's the next hot startup and they're get, getting the most stock um, because we can't offer stock now that we're part of a public, or we can't offer, I should say, private stock now that we're part of a, a big public company. So we, we love the talent here. Um, the, one of the challenges in the Bay Area, I'm, I'm friends with you know, all the guys at, at, the, at the social networks out there, and there's always something down the road. So you've always got to be watching your employees just like a hawk. I mean, any employee can walk up and, and walk away from on paper, real money to go for the next hot thing. And so for us out here, we would get great talent. Uh, we treat them really well. And they work for a company that's really fun to work for. So um, engineering, our operations is here. All of our customer support is here. Um, and then in California, we have all of our business functions. So accounting, finance, marketing, business development, sales, kind of all of those functions. It, it works really well for us. Um, so that's kind of long, long story short, that's how we got from point A to point Z. And uh, still with the company, uh, we have huge, huge expectations, huge goals we're trying to hit this year, um, mostly around the product. I think over the last five years, I've come up with probably four or 5,000 things I want to do with the product. I think we're going to get through a few hundred of them this year. But uh, we finally got the people in place to, to do all the things that I think is going to take the business to the next level. And so Darren and I and, and the rest of the senior team, as well as all the employees, are committed to staying with the company. Um, as long as they're leaving us alone and the company's growing and we're having fun, why, what, what else could we want you know, Monday morning when we wake up and go to work? So. That's kind of that's that's the story, and you know I'm I'm really open to talk about whatever people ask. I can I know what I can share, I know what I can't share, and I'll share whatever whatever I can. So I want to you know I want to help any of you guys that have questions about startups, have you know anything that you're curious of, and I think are we good to go to Q and A now?
Is there anything that you did to really proactively increase that word of mouth? Yes, yeah, so uh, it's interesting. Internet businesses, uh, word of mouth doesn't work for every business. I'm, I'm aware of that, and you know, I, I shouldn't, I don't want to give the impression that every business should build on word of mouth. There's definitely places and times to spend, you know, smart dollars on marketing. Um, but, but, but for us, it was about the product. It was about build something that is useful and that you like, and the hope that when somebody else comes across and says, "How do you do this?" You just say, go use Photo Bucket. And that was our goal. And if you go, again, on any forum or any of the major social networks and say, how do I post my photos here? How do I create a slideshow? How do I you know, upload a video? Photo Bucket's still the top, the top thrown out word. Um, and there's continued to be more and more competition. And we've continued to kind of hold that, hold that mind share. Um, there are some technical tricks that, that, I don't want to say tricks, but there's some <laughs> tricks, is, that, sounds, that, sounds, uh, that sounds like it's lucky. Um, there, there's some strategies that you can do in internet marketing. Um, one of the things that we did really well because we link, or third parties are showing photo bucket content, we had all that content linking back to photo bucket. So both from my SEO, SEM standpoint, as well as people clicking an image, and now they're back on the photo bucket, was really how the company grew really fast. YouTube, exact same model. Um, people saw videos embedded on MySpace and said, gosh, where'd they upload this video, or how did they do that? They clicked the video and went, went back to my, or went back to YouTube. Um, it, it's interesting. Internet businesses, I, I, word of mouth doesn't work for every business. I'm, I'm aware of that, and you know, I, I shouldn't, I don't want to give the impression that every business should build on word of mouth. There's definitely places and times to spend, you know, smart dollars on marketing. Um, but, for, but for us, it was about the product. It was about build something that is useful and that you like, and the hope that when somebody else comes across and says, "How do you do this?" You just say, go use Photo Bucket. And that was our goal. And if you go, again, on any forum or any of the major social networks and say, how do I post my photos here? How do I create a slideshow? How do I you know, upload a video? Photo Bucket's still the top, the top thrown out word. Um, and there's continued to be more and more competition. And we've continued to kind of hold that, hold that mind share. Um, there are some technical tricks that, that, I don't want to say tricks, but there's some <laughs> tricks, is, that, sounds, that, sounds, uh, that sounds like it's lucky. Um, there, there's some strategies that you can do in internet marketing. Um, one of the things that we did really well because we link, or third parties are showing photo bucket content, we had all that content linking back to photo bucket. So both from my SEO, SEM standpoint, as well as people clicking an image, and now they're back on the photo bucket, was really how the company grew really fast. YouTube, exact same model. Um, people saw videos embedded on MySpace and said, gosh, where'd they upload this video, or how did they do that? They clicked the video and went back to, went back to, my, or went back to YouTube. So there's um, both technical tricks, and, and I think it all comes back to good product. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Rodolfo English is my second language, so <laughs> bear with me. Uh, I have two, two questions. One is the, uh, when you started your company, what uh, language did you use, and also the dialect that you use? The other one is, uh, can you see the growing of the America in the Spanish-speaking market? Great questions. Um, so the first question was, uh, what languages did we use, the technical side, and then second was, um, really, it sounds like international expansion. Um, we, early on, uh, PHP was the language I was learning at the time, and so it's a, it's a LAMP environment, which is Linux, Apache, MySQL, um, and PHP, all open source. 
Uh, haven't spent money on marketing, haven't spent money on licensing technologies. That's, those are kind of the two things that, that I, I was focused on is saving money. <laughs> so um, it was all, it was all uh, open source and it's still the majority of it is. There's some select licenses for very specific things now, but it's, it's all running on, um, on, on the open source environment. We've added a lot of caching and now um, we've got a whole bunch of interesting things happening, but it's, it's really all, it's all open source. Um, second question on, on uh, moving into Latin America or, or localizing the site. You know, we've, we've struggled with it. We've struggled not from a technical standpoint, but from a business standpoint. Uh, we really feel that in the U.S., um, if we look at the addressable market, uh, there's sounds like over 100 million people now on the, on the Internet in the U.S., and we feel that that market's ripe and the advertising model works here. And we really have focused on maturing that market. Um, every time we look at building the model out overseas, uh, the same exact model doesn't lend itself to Latin America or South America or you know or Russia. There's there's just a lot of locales that it doesn't work for because the you know the the advertising market in the U.S. for online advertising is bigger than the GDPs of a lot of these countries. So it just isn't there. Um, we will expand internationally, but I think with slightly different business models, whether it's more mobile focused or different kinds of revenue opportunities. Um, one of the other companies that Photo Bucket owns is called Tiny Pick, and um, actually the, the guys that run Tiny Pick, Dan and Mike, are here. Um, Tiny Pick was a, a site I, I also wrote that was testing technologies. We've localized in Tiny Pick, and Tiny Pick is doing well internationally from a traffic standpoint. Um, they're trying to figure out what's the best way to monetize uh, the international traffic. So we'll, we'll expand, but we didn't go out and invest a ton of money on it until we can really figure it out. We kind of try to walk before we run. Hi, uh, <clears throat> uh, so when you got your first round of funding, I think you said it's $10,000, but uh, you had gotten out of the donations and you were also going to step up, the idea was to step up the marketing. My question is, can you itemize a few of the specifics, like uh, you know, paid sponsoring, you know, search engine optimizations, uh, advertising, whatever? Yeah, so we, um, what we did is we, rather than go out and spend money on marketing, we went out and hired people to go figure out how to market for free. <laughs> and so <laughs> one, of the, uh, one, of the, one of the things that people still don't know about Photobucket is that almost a third of our users have come through affiliates. To this day, we have almost paid affiliates no money. They don't need money. They're, all of our affiliates are, are people that are building um, websites that need some sort of hosting for photos and videos. They happen to have some amount of traffic. Um, there's probably some amount of that traffic that overlaps with PhotoBucket as we get larger, but there's a lot that isn't. So what we essentially did is built an affiliate program and said, look, we'll give you free hosting. You drive us users. Really simple. We'll, we'll take users as a bounty. And uh, so we, we actually hired people to go out and build affiliate programs versus spending it on, you know, on this, you know, buying, buying keywords and whatnot. And we still don't really do that today. Um, the, the cost to acquire a user for us is, is so much cheaper through affiliates and partners and product development than it is traditional marketing that we just don't do it. Uh, Your affiliates are who? Uh, affiliates are other social networks. They're 18-year-old kids that run sites like myfreelayouts.com. They make hundreds of thousands of dollars every month in Google AdWords, and they do that. They make that money because they're using really a you know a, a photo bucket on the back end that's not that's not um, costing them anything. But we're getting thousands, tens of thousands, millions of new users from some of these affiliates, and so that's uh, the, the, most of them are the layout sites that are building. Um, third-party services for the large social networks. I have two questions. One, can you tell us what your uh, acquisition cost per customer is? And two, going back to your first deal, and you said you didn't take the, the most favorable term sheet. Was, the, was it the preferences um, that killed that, the bigger deals, or was it personalities and how you thought you were going to get along with people? Uh, so I'll start with that one, that one first. Um, it was definitely the personalities. We, we felt that we wanted somebody that understood the business um, and was willing to be next to us 
whether we succeeded or not. Um, the, other, the other thing that really got us on that deal was um, Jerry Murdoch, the founder of Insight uh, out of New York, lives in Aspen. And he came down and, you know, I'll say he wowed us a little bit. He you know, took us in his plane and, you know, did kind of, kind of said, look, this is what we do. This is how we handle companies. He told me how he built his first company. And I, I saw a very similar pattern that I, that I was going through. And so for, uh, for us, it was about, hey, these are good guys that are not going to kick us out if it doesn't work. They're going to they're gonna be there to help us. Um, so it was definitely more, uh, the, the, as far as overall terms, they, they were they were very similar. We had beaten them to where we were comfortable with the terms. What was the first question? It was uh, cost per oh cost per customer. Uh, we use I'm not I'm not able to talk about the exact um, acquisition price, but ten dollars per unique visitor is kind of a, per U.S. unique visitor is kind of a, a metric that you've seen out there a lot. Um, sites like YouTube were more in the twenty thirty dollar range per unique visitor. Um, so these media companies say, look. How much can I make on a unique visitor over some lifetime that they advertise? Could you talk about the video uh, services? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the video services. So we uh, we feel that video is is another digital medium, just like photos, that's more self-expressive. Uh, we decided to launch video in 2006, early 2006. Uh, I think it was, um, we all sat down and said, let's launch video. What does that mean? I believe within a month, we already had video up in a, in a, a beta standpoint. We didn't know how we were going to make money on it. We didn't know how we were going to market it. We didn't know what we were going to do with it, but we knew we were going to offer video because camera phones and digital phone or digital cam cameras were now able to capture video. And so how do we get that on the photo bucket and let them share it? So the video service today is upload it just like you do a photo. Um, share that through email or IM or social networks and we have video, video editing. We teamed up with Adobe to do our remix tool which allows you to mix and match video with photos. Um, and for, for our user base, which is typically the younger demographic, they want self-expressive tools that let them create something custom. Because at the end of the day, they want to have the coolest thing in their group of friends. And so how do you give them the tools? So our video tools, I would say, are as, as important as, as the video offering itself. Alex, I have two questions for you. Actually, or maybe it's two facets of the same question. How do you manage content quality? In other words, there's two pieces to that. There's porn and yep. content that you would like to censor, but then you get into legal issues. And then there's the violation of intellectual property. These are absolutely dogging things like YouTube and Flickr. So yep. what are your policies on that? And how have you guys found that you either flamed out <laughs> or had things move pretty smoothly? Um, they've moved. They've, they've gone smooth for us, and I'll explain why. We early on chose to be aggressive on keeping the porn and the objectionable content out. We spend millions and millions of dollars every year on doing that. Um, we, we decided early on that there was, there was a strategic advantage for us for one, our, our users. They don't want to be seeing it on there, or if they do, then you know, we don't want our, those users on there. And we, we felt for the partners, the affiliates um, that were most of the time kids running these sites, and lastly was the advertisers. They don't want to see it on there either. So there was those three pieces of our business, and we said, look, if none of these are, are lending itself well to this, let's just not allow it. Um, so what we did is we got a proprietary system that um, is cre it really allows people to scan through mass amounts of images. I think our, our content moderation moderation team, and a single individual can do 250, 300,000 images in a single day. And so we've got um, teams here, we've got um, some outs outsource in, uh, in Iowa that also do it, but they are looking at all the content coming in. And we, we look at what's objectionable and what's not. It's not just what's porn and what's not, but there's certain things around hate crimes or certain things that, that you need to watch for. Um, so your other question was, was really regarding probably DMCA and Safe Harbor and some of those things. Um, so we, you have to be very careful what you're doing. If you're proactively looking for copyrighted material, like you're saying, I'm looking for any SNL ripoff video or I'm looking for this specific piece of, of IP that somebody's copyrighted, you now fall out of Safe Harbor. What that means is now you've got to proactively do that for everybody for every piece of content out there. Uh, we can't possibly have these content moderators manage this type of content as well as now everything out there. So what we do is um, we rely on DMCA. We have a very tight process that says 
look, if, we, if something is on the site that you hold rights to and you don't want it there, here's the DMCA forms that are the same as they are everywhere else, submit them, um, and, and we'll counter notice and do all the things that we need to do in our process. So that's how we handle both those scenarios. I'm going to wrap up because I want to leave plenty of time for networking, but I would like to give a huge you know, thanks to this panel for being so phenomenal for this talk tonight.